The committee, the committee will come to order. And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee, not on this subcommittee, are authorized to participate in today's hearing. The hearing is entitled, Examining Corporate Priorities, the Impact of Stock Buybacks on Workers, Communities, and Investment. I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. This hearing will examine the use of stock buybacks, which has grown dramatically over the past two decades and have grown especially quickly in the past two years. When companies have excess cash on hand, they face a choice about what to do with the money. They can use it to invest in research and development, purchase new equipment, raise their employees' wages, or they can pay their own shareholders. Now, I want to be clear, I have nothing against companies returning capital to their shareholders. Shareholders invest their money in promising companies, and if those companies are successful, then shareholders deserve a return on their investment. But how companies return capital to their shareholders is what we're going to discuss today. Companies essentially have two options to do this. They can either pay a cash dividend to all shareholders, or the company can buy back stock from any shareholder willing to sell their stock back to the company. Prior to 1982, public companies very rarely engaged in stock buybacks because the legality of buybacks was questionable. When a company buys back its own stock, it temporarily drives up the price of its stock, which could be considered a form of illegal market manipulation. So companies primarily return capital to shareholders by paying dividends. Then in 1982, the SEC adopted a rule that gave companies a safe harbor when they engaged in stock buybacks. Ever since the SEC adopted that rule, companies have used stock buybacks more and more and have used dividends less. There are a number of reasons why companies prefer buybacks to dividends. One reason is that buybacks are slightly more tax efficient than dividends. But the most important reason, I believe, is that executives at public companies have a personal incentive to favor buybacks over dividends. Because executives are often compensated in company stock, executives can use a buyback program to boost the company's stock price right before selling their own stock at these artificially inflated prices. In fact, a study by SEC Commissioner Robert Jackson found that executives at public companies sold up to five times as much stock as usual immediately following a buyback announcement, which strongly suggests that executives have been abusing stock buybacks for personal gain. In addition, if a company is in danger of missing its earnings per share target, then the executives can simply announce a stock buyback program to temporarily boost the company's earnings per share and hit their target. Unfortunately, the use of buybacks has grown significantly in the past two years, due almost entirely to the 2017 tax bill. Even though many large companies claimed that they would use their tax cuts to reinvest in their businesses or raise their employees' wages, in reality, companies spent roughly 40 to 60 percent of their tax breaks on stock buybacks. Companies in the S&P 500 spent roughly $811 billion on buybacks in 2018, which was a 50% increase from 2017. And buybacks are on pace to increase even more in 2019 to nearly $1 trillion. So with this surge in stock buybacks, I think this hearing is very timely. And we will be examining several pieces of legislation on stock buybacks in this hearing. First, we have a bill by Mr. Garcia called the Reward Work Act, which would prohibit companies from engaging in open market stock buybacks. The bill would also require at least one third of the directors at public companies to be elected by ordinary workers in order to give them a stronger voice in how the company is run. Next, we have a stock buyback reform and worker dividend act, which is the companion to a bill that Senator Sherrod Brown, the ranking member of the Banking Committee, has introduced in the Senate. 
This bill would require public companies that engage in stock buybacks to also reward their workers by issuing a so-called worker dividend every time they engage in stock buybacks. For every one million that company spends on buybacks, they would have to issue a special $1 dividend to all of their ordinary workers too. Third, we have a bill that would require increased disclosures for companies engaging in stock buybacks and would also require SEC approval for the buybacks. Lastly, we have a bill that would require companies to make disclosure about executives' participation in stock buyback programs and how the buybacks will affect executive compensation. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses on this important topic. And with that, the chair now recognizes the ranking member uh, for five minutes and 16 for, for, for an opening statement. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair, and uh, I look forward to having this discussion uh, regarding these uh, stock buybacks and the impact on workers, communities, and Main Street investors. Recently, as you're hearing, this practice of stock buybacks has attracted some scrutiny from uh, some on Capitol Hill. In fact, scru the scrutiny seems to be based on a bit of a myth, so I believe that we should first start with the facts <coughs> on what a stock buyback really is, and we can just call that Stock Buyback 101. So when a private company goes public, it has an initial public offering uh, through which a company divides itself into shares that can be sold to investors. Thus, the members of the public can invest in this company and become shareholders. Shareholders earn regular dividends based on the company's performance, which are generally the incentive for an investor to purchase a company's stock. Shareholders are free to buy and sell shares, thus earning money when they sell their share based on the price at which they initially bought the share. After the IPO, the company or issuer can then opt to issue more shares called share dilution. When the company issues more shares, the value of each share decreases because each share represents a smaller percentage of the company. Alternatively, a company may repurchase its uh, shares of its own stock, thus reabsorbing that portion of its company and reducing the number of shares on the market, increasing the value of each stock uh, and each share. So that is just basic economics. This is commonly referred to as a stock buyback or stock repurchase. Companies use stock buybacks to make shares of it available for dividend reinvestment, stock options, employee stock ownership plans, to provide liquidity in the marketplace, and in many times to, as a preferred and efficient way of returning capital to shareholders. Stock buybacks are important to business and the economy because one, they provide managers with a tax efficient means of returning excess capital to shareholders, and two, they allow managers to signal to investors that their view is that the firm is undervalued when strong. Returning excess capital is value adding for two reasons. First, it helps prevent companies from pursuing growth and size at the expense of profitability and value. Second, by returning capital to investors, repurchases, like dividends, play the critically important economic function of allowing investors to channel their investment from mature or declining sectors of the economy to more promising ones. In 1982, to address concerns over market and price manipulation by issuers, the SEC adopted Rule 10b-18, which created a safe harbor from liability for market manipulation for companies engaged in stock buybacks. However, issuers must adhere to limitations on manner, timing, price, and volume conditions that are intended to minimize the impact that buybacks have on the company's stock price. That was the, that was the speed bump that was put in place by the SEC. Additionally, public companies are required to disclose any purchases of their own stock in their quarterly and annual reports, providing a table showing month-by-month -month statistics including the number of shares purchased, the average price per share paid, the total number of shares purchased under the repurchase program, and the maximum number of shares or maximum dollar amount the company can repurchase under its publicly announced uh, uh, programs. Again, publicly announced programs. So this should not be a mystery or, uh, or somehow be hidden from anybody. So essentially a, box, a stock buyback program is just another way, like dividends, that a publicly traded company can return money to their shareholders. Although dividends provide shareholders with the ability to remain invested in a company while receiving a regular income stream, a business may instead prefer stock buybacks over dividends because of tax considerations, but also because it promotes a more efficient allocation of capital by redistributing excess cash to more productive uses. 
while some continue to create straw man arguments about stock buybacks because they believe it feeds into their political narrative, the fact remains that stock buybacks are just another tool used by companies and managers to promote economic opportunity for their employees while providing sufficient benefits for American workers and Main Street investors like John and Jane 401k. In fact, stock buybacks lead to an increase in the value of their retirement portfolios, 401k plans, pension funds, and college savings accounts. How is that a bad thing? The proposals that we are considering today will do more, to harm, do more harm than good by encouraging more companies to choose to stay private and shy away from the public market. We have had extensive conversations about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Instead, let's work together on proposals that will promote more capital formation and economic opportunity that give these mom and pop investors more choices and increases their ability to grow their savings and retirement accounts. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Today, we welcome the testimony of a distinguished panel of witnesses. First, we have Jesse Fried, who is a professor of law at Harvard Law School. Second, we have Lenore Palladino, who is a senior economist and policy counsel at the Roosevelt Institute, which is located in the district, uh, in my district in Manhattan. Next, we have uh, Janie Grease, who is a leader at United for Respect. Next, we have Derek Coffey, who is a portfolio specialist at Channing Capital Management in Chicago. Last but not least, we have Craig Lewis, who is the Madison S. Whittington Professor of Finance and a Professor of Law at Vanderbilt University. Witnesses are reminded that your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes, and without objection, your written testimony will be made part of the record. Professor Freed, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairwoman Maloney, uh, Ranking Member Huizinga, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify. I'm honored to be here. In my five minutes of remarks, I will discuss the overall level of dividends and repurchases by public firms and explain why it's unlikely to be too high and might, in fact, be too low. Explain how the current disclosure rules around share buybacks are too lax and enable executives to enrich themselves at the expense of public investors and suggest how such abuses could be limited by a simple fix which is requiring corporations to disclose trades in their own shares within two days just like corporate insiders are required to disclose their own trades. I'm happy to share my views on the bills under consideration in the discussion that will follow. Let me begin by addressing the aggregate level of payouts by public companies. U.S. public companies distribute in cash about a trillion dollars a year. About 40% takes the form of dividends and 60% takes the form of repurchases. But this is important. Dividends and repurchases do not actually reflect actual cash flows between shareholders and public companies. Public companies issue huge amounts of stock, and those issuances absorb cash from shareholders and put them back directly or indirectly into companies. So the way to think about capital flows between firms and public shareholders is to look at net shareholder payouts, which is dividends plus repurchases minus equity issuances. So for example, in 2018, U.S. public companies distributed about $1.4 trillion in cash through dividends and repurchases, but they simultaneously issued about $750 billion in equity. So the net shareholder payouts to public investors was about $650 billion. Now, $650 billion sounds like a lot of money, but it's only a portion of the profits that these firms have generated. My research with Professor Charles Wang at Harvard Business School indicates that there's no reason to think that firms are distributing too much cash. Investment <clears throat> measured as capital expenditures plus research and development expenses are at an all-time record. Um, now, you might say, well, maybe they would be even higher if firms had more cash. But firms have been accumulating uh, $5 trillion of cash through 2018 even though they've been making record payouts and spending record amounts on investment. Now, there might be individual public firms that don't have a lot of cash, 
but those firms can simply issue more stock in the public markets. That's one of the reasons why firms go public, so they can easily finance themselves. And in fact, Charles Wang and I have found that if you look at the smallest public companies, they are routinely absorbing more capital from public investors than they are distributing capital through dividends and repurchases. Another thing to remember, and <clears throat> this echoes what um, Senator, uh, Representative Huizinga said, is that the capital that flows out of these companies is not like wasted. It's available for investment in private companies, which are smaller, uh, faster growing, and absorb hundreds of billions of dollars of capital each year. Everybody is focused on public companies because they're big and they disclose information to investors in the public, so we see them. But companies that are not traded are just as an important part of the economy. They account for about half of the um, <clears throat> fixed investment in the economy, and they employ 70% of the workforce, of the non-government workforce. So capital that flows out of public firms can flow into, uh, into uh, private firms. <clears throat> so um, there's $5, million, $5 trillion sitting in these companies, and, um, and it's unlikely that that money is better left there than being distributed. So <clears throat> um, while the overall level of, of distributions is probably not too high, um, there are problems with the use of repurchases to distribute cash. The first is that they can be used for indirect insider trading. Executives who own stock in the company can profit by having the company buy stock at a low price. This can systematically transfer value to insiders. I've estimated that the value transfer is on, on the order of several billion dollars a year. In addition, companies can use buybacks to prop up the stock price as executives are selling, and this can help executives sell their shares at a higher price. Um, <clears throat> both of these abuses are facilitated because of the disclosure rules. It's expired, so okay. wrap up real quick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically, the disclosure rules around repurchases are very lax. You have to disclose trades, um, not individually, and after a couple of months. If you required firms to disclose their trades immediately or within two days and in detail, you would be able to curb a lot of these abuses. Thank you very much. Ms. Palladino, you're now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney and Ranking Member Huizinga for inviting me to speak today. It's an honor to be here. I join you today to discuss the causes and consequences of stock buybacks. Stock buybacks may sound like a technical matter of corporate finance. Why does it matter whether or not corporations repurchase their own stock? When a company executes a stock buyback, they prop up their share price for the benefit of share sellers but the funds spent on buybacks are then unavailable for the types of, types of corporate activities that could make the company more productive over the long term, investments in future productivity and in workers. Stock buybacks are virtually unregulated, even though Congress has recognized their potential for market manipulation and companies are spending billions of dollars a year. Stock buybacks have reached record volume, corporations spent roughly 900 billion on them in 2018, and projections for 2019 are even higher. The volume of stock buybacks explains why more money has flowed out of our public capital markets than has flowed back in for the non-financial sector for years. Let me explain why stock buybacks are virtually unregulated. SEC Rule 10b18, the Stock Buyback Safe Harbor, gives companies the go-ahead to spend up to 25% of their trading volume on buybacks without liability for market manipulation, but also states that there is no presumption for liability for companies spending above that limit. Furthermore, the SEC does not collect the kind of information necessary to even determine if companies are staying within the daily safe harbor limit. Importantly, there are no meaningful limits to stop executives from using corporate money on stock buybacks to raise share prices for their own short-term gain. Executives are not required to disclose that they've conducted a buyback until the next quarter's filing. Meanwhile, there are no substantive limits to stop them from selling their own personal shares in the same quarter as they are executing buybacks. This is why there is an urgent need for new policies. Congress and the SEC recognized decades ago that this kind of practice could manipulate the market. Rule 10b18 was a sharp departure from the proposals made by the SEC in the 1970s that clearly recognized that the large volume of stock buybacks could have a manipulative effect. Companies are conducting stock buybacks in the midst of layoffs, calls by their workforce for an end to poverty wages, and clear alternate uses for 
corporate funds. Let me give a few examples. Boeing spent $43.1 billion on stock buybacks from 2013 to 2019, raising the company's stock price to a record high just 10 days before the second crash of its 737 MAX. Yet the company reportedly avoided spending the estimated $7 billion it would have needed to engineer a safer plane. Less than 10 years after a public bailout, GM has spent $10.6 billion on stock buybacks while engaging in layoffs and plant closures. That amounts to roughly $220,000 for each GM worker who has been on strike. Walmart spent $9.2 billion on stock buybacks in the last year, which could have been used to give a raise of roughly $5 an hour to each of its, each of its 1 million hourly workers. Some have argued that stock buybacks serve the stock market by moving capital from companies that have no use for it to companies with a higher need for funds. This requires companies to issue new shares rather than for shares to simply trade on the secondary markets. Yet we've seen fewer shares issued than shares repurchased for years. This also begs the question, could it really be the case that so few American corporations have innovative ideas, could pay down debt, or invest in their workforce? I argue there is another motivation for the high volume of stock buybacks, propping up stock prices for the benefit of short-term share sellers, which can include corporate executives. I recommend that Congress ban stock buybacks, or in the alternative, place low bright line limits on their use. A ban is the clearest mechanism to ensure fairness and investor confidence in our capital markets by removing the ability of corporations to manipulate the price of their own stock. In the alternative, Congress should limit the volume of permissible buybacks to a bright line percentage of outstanding shares and remove the safe harbor so as to dampen both the potential for stock price manipulation and encourage the use of corporate funds for productive purposes. At minimum, policy reforms must prohibit corporate insiders from selling their personal shares in the aftermath of a buyback before it is disclosed. And any buyback program should be immediately disclosed. I applaud the committee for taking a hard look at stock buybacks, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Grice, you are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney and Congresswoman Waters for inviting me here to speak today. I'm honored to be here. My name is Janie Grice, and I'm from Marion, South Carolina. I worked at Walmart as a cashier and later as a customer service manager while I was raising my son as a single mother. I'm here today as a leader with United for Respect to speak on behalf of the 1.4 million associates who work for Walmart. Most of you don't know Marion, South Carolina. We're a small town in the American South that many have forgotten. When our first Walmart came to town, everyone was so excited. We lost so many jobs when manufacturing factories shut down and moved overseas. Finally, we had jobs that paid well and where management treated you well. Then our little Walmart became a super center and everything changed. All of a sudden, there were half as many available hours, but twice as much work for each associate. I'd been trying to work at Walmart for years because people said it was a good company to work for, and I was promised full-time hours. So I started out as a cashier working for $7.78 an hour. In my four years there, I never got to full-time employment or a stable schedule. Do you know how hard it is to spend time with your family or pay your bills when you have no clue how many hours of work you're going to get or when you're going to work? I always had to choose my job at Walmart over time with my son because without me working, we couldn't have the things that we had. I want my son and grandson to have a better future. So I left to, I left to find something else even though I love my Walmart family. That's why I was so mad when I read about the $20 billion in buybacks from Walmart that made the executives and Walton heirs even richer. I don't mind investors making profits. I do mind when associates like me who have been putting the work in day after day, year after year, don't get to share in those profits. This is exactly why I filed a shareholder proposal at Walmart last year that rewards associates for our dedication and commitment to the company by getting a share of the profits from buybacks. Shockingly, my proposal didn't pass, but it started a real conversation about how corporations like Walmart need to make different choices instead of squeezing workers. Lenore Palladino's research shows that $10 billion of buybacks that Walmart authorized could have been used to give a million associates a $5 hourly wage increase. If I sat on Walmart's board of directors, I wouldn't think twice about approving that decision. Can you imagine how much turnover we could reduce or how many part-time associates could get off of public benefits? It's so painful to think that this could have been a reality, but a small group of people at the top decided not to prioritize associates like me. And this isn't just happening in retail, but also in other industries. 
At Wells Fargo, a third of their workers made $15 an hour while the bank has authorized over $40 billion in buybacks since 2017 tax bill. At AT&T, the hedge fund Elliott Management is trying to strip down the company and use that money for buybacks, money that could be used to bring internet access to workers and businesses. What these companies are doing with buybacks is both wrong and harmful to the majority of us. And we don't get a say in any of it. Think about what corporate America would look like if workers at Walmart, Wells Fargo, AT&T, Sears, and other companies actually had a seat at the table. We would invest the corporate profits back into the company, the workers, and investors. This is what my fellow United for Respect leader, Kat Davis, was saying when she filed a shareholder proposal at Walmart this year to have hourly associates on the company's board. Her proposal makes the case that having hourly workers on the board can lead to long-term profitability for all of us. Right now, Walmart's pay is so low that a full-time associate earning a starting wage still falls below the federal poverty line for a family of three. How shameful is that that we have to live in poverty while working for the largest private employer in the world, which has billionaire owners who are worth $175 billion. So what this committee is doing on regulating buybacks is really important. I'm here to ask you to seriously consider who you stand with. Working people like me who work hard and reap little rewards or corporate billionaires who will exploit every loophole to get richer. By regulating how corporate profits are spent and who benefits from them, you are putting workers first and letting corporate America know that we matter. You're saying that if a company can issue billions in buybacks, it can afford a living wage and full-time employment for its workers. You're saying that it's time to end economic inequality in the U.S. so that working mothers like me can save for a better future for our kids. These days, we have to work two or three jobs to make ends meet. We catch hell with all of the expenses and taxes we have to pay. We don't have billion dollar inheritances to fall back on, like the Waltons do. But we have the power of our voices to call out corporations like Walmart for doing wrong by us. Buybacks are a rigged game. They're not good for workers or for American companies. We need bold, decisive action from all of you to reign in corporate America and level the playing field. Working people like me deserve a better shot at fairness and equality. Thank you. Very much. Uh, Mr. Coffey, you're now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Sorry, uh, By way of background, Channing Capital Management is a Chicago-based investment management firm serving institutional investors that was founded, founded in 2003. We currently have over $2 billion in assets under management and are a diverse-owned firm with the majority of our equity held by African Americans. We focus on small, mid-cap products um, with domestic and international exposure. Um, it's worth noting that while we have a diverse client base, a large portion of our clientele consists of defined pension benefit plans, um, many of whom are union workers, policemen, firefighters, teachers, city and state municipal workers, all who also benefit from stock buybacks. So let me quickly just outline why, what are stock buybacks and why companies use them. When discussing capital allocation strategies such as dividends or stock buybacks, the old maxim, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is often quoted. In short, investors view the certainty of upfront cash as less risky and generally prefer the assurance of receiving some cash in hand, which gives them options to decide when, where, and how to deploy cash receive to generate a higher return. When capital exceeds a company's ex expenditure needs, returning this capital to shareholders is considered a prudent strategy that empowers investors to redeploy excess cash to areas where they can find better growth opportunities. In short, buybacks help companies to manage their capital structure. They provide more flexibility relative to dividends for capital allocation or capital return. They offset dilution from employee stock options. And they provide important share price signaling and support, particularly in cases where the market has a more pessimistic view of a company relative to actually the company's internal management. Let me discuss how buybacks benefit our clients. As I noted earlier, a large number of our clients are defined benefit pension plans, but we also have a decent and growing exposure to endowments, foundations, wealth management firms, and corporate plans. The common thread across all these clients, um, including people who invest in 529s so or saving for college plans for their children, and just regular investors that are saving for retirement is that they all benefit from buybacks. Buybacks encourage better alignment of management with shareholders, addressing the agent principal issue. When managers of a company actually own the shares, they can act more in the interest of the long-term shareholder value. Buybacks help boost share price, which again helps our end clients. But buybacks provide tax benefits, being that they're taxed at the capital gains rate, whereas dividends are non-qualified dividends are taxed at the ordinary income rate. And buybacks offer investor choice. Investors that are looking for an opportunity to deploy capital to higher returns, buybacks provide that liquidity to go and find that opportunity. Um, with that said, 
there are definitely instances where buybacks do warrant greater scrutiny or could potentially be harmful to investors. Buybacks that are exclusively used to achieve short-sighted goals via financial engineering are especially harmful. A second example are instances where a company has a long history of sherry purchases but continues to lose shareholder value despite these efforts. We at Channing have very little patience for management teams that use buybacks and other means to engage in short-sighted financial engineering schemes. Good companies, in our view, productively utilize their capital to hire employees, invest in their businesses, and expand their market share. And companies that don't do these things don't get quality, don't, get, don't deliver no longer shareholder value and their shares are sold. Let me briefly address why buybacks have, buybacks have surged over the past several years. And it really is for two reasons. The extended duration of the bull market that started in 2009 and the tax reform legislation that has encouraged more repatriation of overseas profits. It is no surprise that buybacks have surged across small and, um, large and small capitalization stocks since the beginning of the current economic crisis. Typically, buybacks increase during periods of economic expansion, and they are less robust in periods of economic contraction. And so when we take a look at buybacks, it really reflects the fact that um, repatriation created an opportunity to bring a lot of excess cash from overseas into the United States. More importantly, this is most prominent amongst large cap companies, particularly companies in the technology sector. Smaller capitalization companies don't have, didn't have as much cash overseas, and so this issue was exacerbated particularly among um, companies that are large cap, companies that have a lot of overseas cash locked over, um, held overseas, and it's also the long duration of the bull market. So with that said, let me talk a little bit about the risk of increased restrictions on buybacks. Any proposed legislation that is designed to stymie or retard buyback activity could result in negative consequences for investors, the economy, and the optimal allocation of capital. The key question one should ask is whether it's better to legislate an issue that is cyclical or one that reflects a structural imbalance. I would argue that the recent buyback activity is much more cyclical in nature. Allow me to outline some of the potential pitfalls of legislation that could potentially curtail buybacks. Restrictions could trap capital in businesses, leading to inefficient allocation of capital. They could impede the movement of capital to future growth opportunities. They could force businesses to use inefficient means to distribute cash to shareholders. And ultimately, you, 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 the, the, another consequence is the restriction on buybacks, you lose the powerful signaling tool. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank the subcommittee for inviting me to address this important topic, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Professor Lewis, uh, you're now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Hizinga, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to appear today to discuss corporate priorities as they relate to share repurchase programs workers, communities, and investment. The House Financial Services Committee is considering a number of regulatory initiatives designed to reduce or even eliminate the ability of corporations to repurchase shares. In my written testimony, I discuss the economic substance of share repurchase programs or stock buybacks and argue that they represent a highly efficient way to distribute excess cash to shareholders. There are four House bills under consideration, the Reward Work Act, the Stock Buyback Reform and Worker Dividend Act of 2019, the Stock Buyback Disclosure Improvement Act of 2019, and a fourth Stock Buyback Disclosure Bill. All of these rules reflect an implicit perspective that share repurchase re programs represent a market failure that cannot be resolved through private action. Opponents of share buyback programs typically argue that they artificially inflate share price, crowd out investment, result from managerial short-termism, and disproportionately benefit the wealthy and corporate insiders. I argue in my written testimony that these conjectures are either not supported by empirical analysis or are based on misconceptions about how share repurchase programs actually operate. Although similar to ordinary dividends, share repurchases differ in several important ways. The most compelling examples include their ability to signal undervalued share price, their role as a mechanism for distributing excess cash, individual income tax advantages, and reallocation effects. This last point is particularly important because the cash paid to shareholders does not disappear. The reallocation of excess cash into consumption and other investments potentially redirects it to activities that have a higher value than the incremental investments that are available to firms. These examples contrast sharply with critics who view stock buybacks as nothing more than financial gimmicks that crowd out investment and artificially inflate share price. Although I'll be happy to discuss this in detail should you have questions, I would, however, like to emphasize that the empirical evidence is inconsistent with the notion 
that stock buybacks in some way constrain investment in the future. With respect to the bills that are the topic of today's hearing, allow me to first discuss two bills that are designed to reduce the ability of corporations to repurchase shares, the Reward Work Act and the Stock Buyback Reform and Worker Dividend Act of 2019. The Reward Work Act calls for the outright prohibition of share repurchase programs. The second bill would require firms that repurchase shares to pay workers an amount proportional to the amount spent on buybacks. Both bills are based on the premise that if share repurchase programs are cur curtailed or become more expensive, firms will elect to increase investment in tangible and intangible assets like R&D and pay workers more. If regulation creates incentives for firms to reinvest rather than distribute excess cash, it would likely lead to an overinvestment problem in which firms would make inferior investments that would be unlikely to benefit the economy in the long run. The second set of bills, namely the Stock Buyback Disclosure Improvement Act of 2019 and a second Stock Buyback Disclosure Bill, are designed to increase transparency around share repurchase programs. The first of these bills is largely a response to SEC Commissioner Robert Jackson's views regarding executive participation in share repurchase programs. For reasons I discuss in my testimony, I believe that the underlying research that informs these concerns fails to document a significant market failure. The second bill seeks to increase mandatory disclosure about the nature and purpose of planned share repurchase programs. This bill includes a requirement that firms must pre-announce a repurchase program 15 days prior to its execution. Since repurchase programs are typically executed over relatively long periods of time, it is unclear how, in the context of the existing empirical evidence, mandatory pre-announcement is preferable to the existing 8K and insider trading disclosure requirements and 10Q filings. The most surprising aspect of this bill is that the SEC would be required to approve buyback programs before they can be implemented. This is the decision to require a disclosure-based regulator like the SEC to become involved in financial decisions is unprecedented. Not only does the SEC lack the expertise to make such determinations, it's unclear how this serves the Commission's tripartite mission of investor protection, the maintenance of fair and orderly and efficient markets, and the facilitation of capital formation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, uh, Ms. Palladino, you, you mentioned in your testimony that stock buybacks are a driver of income and wealth inequality. Can you talk a little bit more about how buybacks are contributing to increased inequality? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, it's important to recall that gains from share selling flow disproportionately to a small group of wealthy households, and I'll give you a few numbers from the Federal Reserve's distributional financial accounts. As of the second quarter of 2019, the top 1% of the wealth distribution owns 52% of corporate equities, while the bottom 50% owns just 2.2%. In other words, the gains flow disproportionately to those in the very top of the wealth distribution. It's also important to note that 92% of corporate equities are held by, wealth, by, wealth, uh, by white households. So when we look at the combined effects of income and wealth, we can see the disproportionate flow to the top. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Grease, you mentioned in your testimony that you think it's a very good idea for large companies to have ordinary workers represented on their boards. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the benefits of having worker representation on corporate boards? What sort of perspective would the worker representative bring to the boards that current board members don't have? Thank you, Ms. Maloney, for that question. Well, hourly associates are the closest one to the problems at the company, so we're also closest to the solutions. For us to have a voice at the top means that we could tell the executives what the other associates and consumers think and how to solve these issues immediately instead of waiting years. Uh, take family leave policies, for example. We have that at Walmart because we fought for it. We told home office that this was this is what associates need, and they just ignored us. Imagine how much they could have saved on turno turnover if they listened to us sooner. This could have been a real partnership where we have the power to guide and better, more humane decisions. Thank so, you. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Coffey, you talked about how as an investor you have to distinguish between buyback programs that are beneficial and those that are being used for short-term financial engineering. How do you distinguish between these two types of buybacks? So at Channing, one of the things we do is we look at our companies, we talk to our management teams regularly, and we have financial models. We can see very clearly when a company is using buybacks to typically, when they're using these tools, they use it to shrink, shrink their shares outstanding, and that increases their return on equity. We have models that can tell us very clearly what a company's real return on equity is um, when you sort of adjust for stock buybacks. And so any sort of financial engineering that doesn't increase the long-term value of the company, which is sort of how we look at it, we look at long-term intrinsic value of the company, and if actions are not necessarily increasing that, but they're increasing short-term metrics, we can call them out. And we can also see that when we look at the proxy statements when comp with, with compensation, we can see what, what, whether those goals are short-sighted and they're motivating management to move to a short-term goal. So our models allow us to see that. And Professor Freed, you, you mentioned in your testimony that other countries have rules similar to the two-day disclosure rules that you're proposing. Japan, Hong Kong, the UK already have similar disclosure rules. What were the effects in these countries when they implemented those rules? Did stock buybacks decline? Did executives' trading behavior change? What happened? So I haven't studied um, what uh, happens in terms of the implementation of these rules in these other countries. Um, generally, the level of buybacks in the UK, Hong Kong, and Japan um, is much lower than in the United States. Um, <clears throat> the point is that it is possible to require companies to disclose this information within two days. Other, other countries have figured out how to do this, so there's no reason that we can't do it. The effect on capital markets, if at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's been a study that uh, looks at the effect of the imposition of these disclosure rules in these other countries. As far as I know, these disclosure rules have, have been used in these countries for decades. So I don't think it's something that was recently done that would allow like an econometric test to see what the effect was. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I reel back and I now recognize the distinguished ranking member for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Coffey, I want to start with you. I, 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 I love the term, the financial engineering uh, decisions. And I, I am curious, you were talking about you have models uh, that identify those people. Uh, or those uh, those entities, uh, what percentage of companies that you invest in would you say uh, uh, have some sort of short-term, short-sighted, harmful financial engineering decisions versus longer term? I'd say, given that we have a long holding period for our companies, our turnover is about 30%. Um, we hold our companies in three to five year periods, and it's trying to buy high quality companies with free cash flow and long-term objectives, I'd say essentially less than 1%. Um, it's a long-term focus, and management teams that shift their focus to you know, short-sighted objectives, they're removed from our portfolio. So, so it's, it, it is, because that was gonna be one of my questions, is how do you, how do you deal with that? You, you identify them and you remove them from your portfolio and no longer invest in them, right? That's correct. Okay, um, and because this is, this is one of my general questions as we're, as we're talking about this. So whether it's been repatriation that, that you brought up, uh, whether it's been a booming economy uh, that has brought in additional cash uh, to, uh, to companies uh, and, uh, and, and their workers and others, what are these entities supposed to do with this additional cash? Um, at, at some point, if you have the equipment that you need, if you have the right number of employees that you need, um, and you have increased wages, you have, which we have seen statistically has, been, has gone up, you have done bonuses, you've done all these things. What else are you supposed to do with this, with this cash? And Mr. Lewis, and Mr. Fried, I'm curious, and Mr. Coffey, I mean, what, what, else, what else should they do with this? Because it seems like you're, you're suddenly into a question of reallocation and maybe a misallocation of, of those resources. Well, uh, I'll, I'll start first. Um, so the first thing is that when you think about capital allocation, again, you've already mentioned it. When a company exhausts all their sort of means of deploying capital, they've, they've, paid, they've uh, invested in plants, equipment, they've done um, research and development, and they've done also investment in human capital, 
the best thing to do with that excess capital is, and they've also considered mergers acquisitions to gain market share in a particular industry. The best thing to do is to find a way to distribute that capital because it introduces opportunities for a business to actually destroy shareholder value. You can make an acquisition or you can overpay for an acquisition or you could engage in you know, activity that is just not accretive to shareholders. So companies that are, basically you think about the term capital as osmosis. When you have excess capital after you've kind of exhausted your needs, that capital should be recycled to other areas where uh, other growth opportunities you can get the future companies of the, that, we, that we think about today that are gonna drive shareholder value in the future. Uh, Mr. Lewis, um, how does a healthy stock market benefit seniors and middle class? So, um, I think Mr. Coffey talked about a lot of his clients are participate in, in defined benefit pension plans. And so the way that stock buybacks benefit investors is that companies announce stock buybacks when they believe their firm's stock price is undervalued. And it turns out that that's a credible signal, right? Investors interpret stock buybacks as an incredible signal, largely because management owns significant equity stakes in the company, and they would be reluctant to overpay for shares in a stock buyback program when they're directly subsidizing the shareholders that sell. So it benefits seniors, it benefits retirees to the extent that and, when and stock do, prices go up, the value of their portfolio And do additional goes. regulations help achieve economic growth? Uh, in this case, you know, I was, for, I was a, the chief economist at the SEC, and one of the uh, important factors for basically promulgating or proposing any rule is to demonstrate that there's a market failure that can't be resolved through private action. And so in this case, it's unclear to me what the market failure actually is. Okay, uh, I've got a few seconds left. Uh, uh, Professor Freed, um, uh, you, uh, you had had a uh, post on Harvard Law School Forum on uh, corporate governance and uh, financial regulations um, that uh, some of these bills that would prohibit buybacks are based on a, quote, profound misunderstanding of how the U.S. economy works, uh, close quote. I'm curious if you could explain what that means, and, and then uh, do you believe that, uh, or do you agree with some of the thinking that uh, cash on the balance sheet would either go to buybacks or directly to workers? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, <clears throat> I think there are a lot of misconceptions in the conversation around buybacks. The first is we don't have good ways of thinking about how to measure them. That's why you have to look at equity issuances. If you look at like net repurchases, which are repurchases minus equity issuances, they're much smaller. About 80% of the cash that's distributed through repurchases comes back in through equity issuances. And about 40% of repurchases are used to repurchase shares that are given to employees and executives. I'm sorry, my, my time has, ex has expired. I, I'd like to follow up with that, and I am curious to continue the conversation on this two-day uh, uh, disclosure, whether it's front-end or uh, post-fact, but we'll follow up. Uh, and, and Madam Chair, uh, I'll take a moment as well to uh, just uh, ask unanimous consent uh, that a letter from uh, National Association of Manufacturers Without commenting objection. on the stock. Buyback. Without objection. Thank you. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, is recognized for five minutes. Yeah, Chair Lady Maloney, I, listening to this a very informative discussion, I really think that the heart of this issue here today is this. Why would a company, any company, why would a company make the choice to give back money to their shareholders rather than making an investment in the future growth of the company? Companies could choose to improve workers' benefits, increase training. They could also choose to invest in new technologies and other actions that would expand the growth of the company. But rather, why would they choose, uh, why would they not choose these opportunities? Uh, why do they find them less attractive than returning money to shareholders through a buyout. 
And, and, and so I think that I want to ask you first, Ms. Palladino, why, why is this? What, what are the factors? It seems to me if I'm a CEO, how do I gain? And then here's what I think. I think this, and I think this is this is will point out that when you buy back that stock, does the price of the stock increase? That is the bottom line. Could you um, expound on that? And I'll get to you too, Mr. Lewis, because. I think fundamentally, this is where we are to get to the truth of the matter. Because if I'm a CEO and I got to make a choice, I think we need to be honest with this situation. It's clear that that CEO is the CEO to make more money and profits. I think that's why they buy back the stock. But correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Spadolino. No, thank you. That's an excellent point, and, and I appreciate the question. I think that uh, we see really two reasons why executives are engaged in the volume of stock buybacks that we see today. One is the issue that both myself and Professor Fried spoke about, which is the personal incentive that, stop, that corporate executives have to increase their own compensation because they don't have to disclose that they've conducted stock buybacks until about 10 or 11 weeks after the close of the quarter. Mm -hmm. I think at a deeper level, though, we're talking about an imbalance of power in our economy, where we have activist invector, investors, we have large uh, pools of capital that are putting tremendous pressure on boards and CEOs to return capital as quickly as possible to shareholders without considering the effect that has on the workforce. And, and Mr. Lewis, I want to give you a point. Do you have a counter to what she's saying, or do you agree with her? So I, I actually don't agree with her. My view is, is fairly simple. Um, I think CEOs have particular expertise and things that they're very good at, and they make investments in the businesses that they know best. The idea of taking excess cash that they no longer have productive investments in their own business and finding new investment opportunities probably leads to less um, valuable investment choices in the long run than if you were to give it to somebody who actually is an expert at evaluating those new technologies. So it's one right. of taking money from firms that really don't have a good use for it and putting it in the hands of other entrepreneurs who Let me, actually have a valuable use. Yeah, Mr. Fried and, 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 and Mr. Godfrey, Mr. Fried. Where do you come down on this? So <clears throat> people invest in new companies with the hope of making a profit. They bargain for arrangements that give them the right to throw out the board if the board doesn't hire a good CEO and doesn't deploy the money wisely. That's why pe people invest in companies. So when a company no longer has a way to profitably deploy money, then the right thing to do from the point of view of the shareholders who originally put money in is to send it back. And that's why we see capital flowing out of companies. And Ms. Grice, how do you, what's your point? My time has expired. Your time has expired. Oh, okay. Thank you. We'll go to a second round. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Hill, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, and appreciate your great leadership of this committee and uh, picking this timely topic to talk about. I think this is the third time that we've uh, addressed the stock buyback issue during uh, this Congress. I've got some slides I wanted to run through quickly just to set the stage. This, this first one talks about growth investment because I've heard from my friends that uh, people are not investing in their companies, that instead <clears throat> they're using that money imprudently to uh, invest in stock buybacks. This is since 1990, uh, and you can see in uh, 2018 that we're at a, a really almost all-time high at 17% uh, in the S&P 500. Let's go to the next slide. 
Stop backs, buybacks, as was noted in everybody's opening testimony, did increase uh, during after tax reform. In my view, this is a positive thing. Ta buybacks are tied to the growth in profits in corporate America, so the more profitable companies are, the more they might consider a stock buyback. And certainly the 2017 impact of the tax report uh, caused in the S&P 500 more cash to be reinvested in the United States. And in addition to investing in people and capital investment, they did invest in buying their stock back. So I view this as sort of a, a, a transitory period. Uh, and most of that money, I would say, when you look at it, came from uh, just 20 stocks in the S&P 500, Madam Chair. And those 20 stocks had the most money trapped offshore. So that money came back into the United States and they did participate in the stock back back. So let's go to the next one. Uh, but the pace of investment, as I say, over the long haul is still in that range, investing in companies. You see the December 2017 tax enactment, but growth has only grown. This is growth in companies uh, in R&D, capital expenditures and research. It's all been a positive story the last 30 years. Let's go one more. And then uh, the S&P 500 cash return payout ratios, uh, dividends, net of uh, buybacks, you can see that, uh, that the return of cash historically is still in that historic range where it's been. And I just would argue whether it's paid back in stock buybacks or dividends, it's good for investors. And who does gain here are the investors in our pension plans and our 401k plans. This money doesn't go nowhere. It goes back out into our economy, as Mr. Coffey uh, argued. And I, I read in your materials, you've got a great background uh, in intrinsic investing. I wanted to read a quote from your, uh, someone you admire that you put in your marketing materials, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, CEO at Berkshire Hathaway, says, stock buybacks are sensible for a company when its shares sell at a meaningful discount to conservatively calculated intrinsic value, which you have in your testimony. Indeed, disciplined repurchases are the surest way to use funds intelligently. It's hard to go wrong when you're buying dollar bills for 80 cents or less. Do you agree with that, Mr. Coffey? Absolutely. Good. And he says, don't forget, companies who do that inefficiently are what? Are they punished by the market if they overpay? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Um, also, I noted that uh, uh, a company in my state was referenced, and Ms. Grice, thank you for coming and advocating today on behalf of the workers at Walmart. Uh, I live in Arkansas, so uh, Arkansas is the home to Walmart's headquarters, and proud to have them headquartered there in our state. And I don't think anybody's uh, worked harder to meet this dual effort of trying to invest in their employees since the stock, uh, since the tax uh, plan was announced. They've made over four and a half billion dollars in workforce increases and raised wages and tried to address many of the challenges that you talked about in your experience in South Carolina, which I really took uh, uh, quite fully from your testimony. And, you know, Doug McMillan, who's the CEO there, started out uh, as a teenager earning minimum wage, unloading trucks in the distribution center up there in Northwest Arkansas. So. I really believe that he understands that balance. It's so important to raise wages, which is why uh, their 60% of their employment is uh, now full-time, which I think is one of the highest in the retail industry. So um, they are a, a major employer and I think major in a major way committed to expanding opportunity for their uh, uh, managers and for their uh, workers. I was looking at total wages and benefits of their hourly full-time employees, and when you include the benefit package that Walmart offers, it looked like it was over $19 uh, um, per hour. So, um, uh, Professor Lewis, uh, I wondered, uh, and anchor down, by the way, I'm a Vanderbilt graduate, so God bless Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, Jay Clayton said it was not in the purview of the SEC to make these decisions about capital allocation when he's testified and been in public. Do you, do you agree it's not the commission's view to try to determine asset uh, allocation? Yes, I do. And um, how is there, well, my time's running out, Madam Chair. I'll follow up and uh, I thank the witnesses. Excellent hearing, thank you. Thank you, thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is recognized mm -hmm. for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I wanna thank all the panelists that are here today. Uh, my good friend from Arkansas just said that 
companies are punished if they don't buy the dollar for 80 cents, and I think that certainly would be true. But, uh, Mr. Coffey, I, I think I have a timing issue here. Now, you said that, if I heard you correctly, that if a company had a short-term financial scheme in your portfolio, that you would remove them from your, from your portfolio if they did that. But how would you know that before they repurchased their stock? How would you divine that if there is no notice to you? How would you know that as opposed to the rest of the market? That's a fantastic question. So actually, one of the things that companies are required to file in addition to the 10K and 10Q, which provides a quarterly and annual reporting, is also their proxy statement, which outlines the board-approved compensation plan for the executives. And so we look at that. When we look at it buying a company, we look at the executive compensation, we look at how companies are incentivized, and then we also look at their activities. And if we see that the activity, and it takes time, it's not immediate, it takes time. If we bought a company in a quarter... And but, but that's my point, if I may interrupt you just for a second. But that, that's my point. You find out about it afterwards, right? I mean, I, I think you'd find out about it after it happened. Or before so, we purchased it. So by it. that point, the executive could have, in fact, enriched himself or herself. You're finding out about it. And you want to remove them from portfolio, but that's fine. But it's already happened. Or we find out before we even purchase it. So in our due diligence, we're looking at a company and we're reviewing those results and we're trying to make a decision as to who we buy. Okay. And we do a risk reward assessment and we pick okay. the company that has the best corporate governance. Thank you, I, I don't want to run out of time. Mr. Fried, I want to ask you about that because you talked about timing, I guess, and I, and I do have that concern. I mean, it, it does seem like an executive, and you noticed that a number of the, buy, the, the actual repurchases are from employees, executives. And isn't there potentially a real timing issue here? So the, the timing issue that I've, I focus on in my written testimony is the timing of disclosure around um, the, the firm's repurchases of its own stock. So if you're a corporate insider, you have to disclose within two days the details of every trade. If you are a firm, you disclose like several months later and it's on an aggregate monthly basis so you can't see individual trades. That means that the people who are making the repurchase decisions, they can go into the market when the stock is dipped, buy up a bunch of shares, which benefits them because they own stock in the company, mm -hmm. but it comes at the expense of public investors generally. They can also apply pressure to the price when they're selling to boost the price. We can't see it. Mm -hmm. We can't see it because we don't see the individual trades. We can't apply Rule 10b-5, we can't apply the anti-manipulation laws because we can't see what's happening. Would you disagree with that, Mr. Gaffey? Well, there are a couple of ways that we do know. I mean, there's obviously 8K disclosures. There's also Form 4, which, in, which indicates insider buying and insider purchasing. We don't know it immediately, but we know it within enough time to react to it. And investors do but, find but out But are you you're reacting after? Of course, after. Yeah, we don't and, know it in real time. I think that's the problem. But I don't think it's, it's a, it, 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 it prevents us from actually acting in a way that's best interest of our shareholders. The information is given to us and the street reacts to it in Form 4. We see it. So we know insider buying, we know insider selling. It's a powerful signal. Ms. Paladino, would you agree with that? No, I think the fact that buybacks are not disclosed until the end of the quarter and they're only disclosed on a monthly basis means that, in, and I've looked at this in my own research, there's simply no way to know if executives are taking advantage, as, as Professor Fried said, of the fact that they've used corporate funds to conduct a buyback and personally benefited. And, and in my own research, I've found a strong, uh, significant relationship between increases in use of corporate funds on stock buybacks and the increase of insider share selling for their own personal gain. I think I'll end it right there with one, uh, one caveat. My good friend from Arkansas did mention Vanderbilt, so I have to mention, Mr. Fried, I think you were one year behind me at Harvard, at law school. You in class of 92? Thank you for paving the way for me, yeah. Yeah, you had, you had more black hair and so did I, thank you. Thank you, uh, the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Davidson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you to our witnesses. I appreciate uh, the discussion of an important feature of America's capital markets, uh, frankly, the private ownership of capital. Uh, so uh, let's, let's be clear, the owners of the firm aren't the managers, the owners of the firm are the shareholders. And so the shareholders uh, own that capital, and of course they hire the managers 
uh, collectively to find a return on it. In fact, the return on the invested capital is largely the point of putting the capital at risk. And I guess I'd just like to make the point that when you look at uh, the capital structure, uh, this goes straight to the balance sheet for some uh, of the, the viewers, maybe aren't familiar with the standard assets equal liabilities plus equity. And so uh, the firm might have some cash on the books in a whole host of other assets, but the capital structure is largely comprised of a combination of liabilities and equity, the equity being the shares uh, and the liability potentially being the debt. And right now in the current capital markets, uh, debt capital is far less expensive than equity capital, far less expensive. So if your job as a manager of a firm is to get a return on the invested capital, wouldn't it be rational to use less expensive capital uh, as long as you don't hurt the performance of the firm by over-levering the firm? You know, anyone might find uh, in their own personal, personal uh, household, for example, that, uh, you know, some debt might make some sense. Maybe it's okay to have a mortgage on the house. But too much debt uh, creates real risks, right? But, uh, but if you're in an all-cash position, you're all equity, it's more expensive to operate. You can get a better return on the invested capital. You can certainly get a better return on equity. So, Mr. Coffey, you highlighted that, uh, frankly, at the time people buy uh, shares back, uh, you can't really be sure whether their, their uh, uh, decision to buy them back is righteous or not. It might make sense uh, for a firm to buy the capital back and, and lower their cost of capital and put the, uh, put the returns there. And over time, uh, you can see the fruit of that. Uh, so, you know, what do you find is, uh, is in, in the data that you've collected under the current rules of the game uh, the data that you've collected, what is the holding period that you can start to see? Did that share buyback uh, prove to be the right decision by management on behalf of the shareholders or not? I mean, over the course of our experience, I mean, again, we're long-term holders, we're lower turnover. Um, I think, you know, within our first year, we'll be able to start seeing results. Um, the first question that we'll do, and this is important in our process, is we actually go visit management. If you're engaging in a share buyback or any other capital allocation activity we don't agree with, we have a conversation. We don't see the results showing up in quarterly earnings after a certain period after we've made our initial investment. Usually after that first year, we're asking, where, do we, where are the results and are we making progress? And are there better investment opportunities? Right, and that's one of the things. When you look, you're, you're buying equities, frankly, Correct. right? So when you look at publicly traded companies, there is that pressure. You've got to deliver results inside a year, inside a quarter in some cases, right? But some of the capital projects that are out there, depending on the industry, take aerospace or energy, for example, you're not even looking at a positive cash flow event uh, for five to 10 years. So you're, you're looking at uh, how do you assess that? And who's in the best place? Who's supposed to be in the best place to assess the performance of the firm? Well, the owners are supposed to be. That's why they hire or fire the management. So, you know, Mr. Lewis, as you've highlighted the important functions of, of share buy, buybacks. I guess that's one thing I hadn't heard as much is the cost of capital uh, and, uh, and how that affects the, the performance of the firm. How does that fit with the rest of the analysis that, that you've provided thus far and, uh, and the concerns uh, in the publicly traded uh, space for the cost of capital? So you're right, I didn't actually address the role of using share buybacks to basically optimize your capital structure but it is one of the important features that a CFO and a CFO, one of the tools they would have at their disposal to try to get to a better mix, a better blending of debt and equity financing. And as you point out, debt financing is typically less expensive than equity, largely because interest payments generate a tax shield and dividend payments to shareholders are not tax deductible at the corporate level. So when you look at the two, there's a natural preference. Opposite cash flow uh, consequences for the firm. Uh, and I think opposite consequences for our economy if we, if we impair the ability to this key part of our capital markets. Thank you, my time's expired. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to begin with uh, Ms. Grice. 
uh, and your powerful uh, testimony today. Uh, your story is representative of uh, so many workers at Walmart and other companies around the country. Uh, you described uh, doing years of uh, stressful work at low wages, not controlling your work schedule, and being able to plan around it for family purposes. And you said that your starting wage, if I uh, heard you correctly, was at $7.78 per hour. For how many years did you earn that wage? Um, well, I don't even think I made that wage for a year because I moved up pretty, pretty quickly with the company. I was one of those people who management looked at as a, a good leader, so I didn't stay in that position long, making 778. That was back in 2013 when I started, that I started out with 778 an hour. How many years total did you work there? I worked for Walmart for four years. Four years? Four years, okay. yes, sir. So uh, I can imagine that you were pretty uh, outraged uh, to uh, read about the uh, $20 million uh, in buybacks that Walmart, uh, Walmart's board authorized through 2018 and 2019. Uh, the Roosevelt Institute found that if Walmart had redirected 10 million of that toward 1 million employees, they could have given those employees an hourly wage increase of over $5.66 an hour. When Walmart issues stock buybacks, the largest gains go toward a small handful of wealthy individuals. A single family, the Waltons, owns roughly half of Walmart shares. The Walmart company's net worth is estimated to be around $201 billion. I also want to focus on the additional stress that an unreliable schedule can add when you are working a minimum or hourly job like yours, Ms. Christ. Raising a family, arranging for childcare, juggling a second job, or taking night classes to pursue another career can be challenging enough, even if your hours are predictable. It is tougher still when you don't have reliable scheduling. So clearly Walmart is prioritizing shareholders over the interest of the millions that it employs. Uh, and you mentioned uh, your colleague, uh, Kat Davis, who filed a shareholder proposal demanding hourly employees be considered for Walmart's board. Can you tell me what it would mean for employees like you to have more of a voice in how a giant corporation like Walmart is run? Well, it would mean a lot for us. Um, there's a lot of things that goes on in these stores that corporate or home office has no clue about. So being able to have someone who's inside those stores day to day that knows exactly what goes on, the blatant disrespect, uh, not getting full-time hours, you know, uh, not being able to get full benefits because you're part-time. There's a lot that an associate would be able to bring to the board of directors. I also want to talk about another aspect of your testimony. Last month, uh, the activist hedge fund Elliott Management launched a campaign to pressure AT&T to increase its stock buybacks and split its cash flow between debt and payments and buybacks. As of June 30th, AT&T had $22 billion in free cash flow available. Ms. Palladino, when a company like AT&T has a cash of that size on hand, what are some of the long-term investment options available to it? Well, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think that the letter um, from Elliott Management about AT&T really highlights the kind of pressure that we know that activist investors are bringing on companies like AT&T in which they call for an increase in stock buybacks because they're virtually unregulated. They're able to call for that increase uh, and essentially they called for a reduction in the workforce. With that kind of free cash flow, a company like AT&T could provide broadband, invest in upgrading our nation's infrastructure for the economy that's you know, coming for the 21st century, and of course continue to support an innovative and uh, developing workforce. Uh, thank you very much. I think my time's run out. Madam Chair, I yield back. Are there general other uh, witness people that wish to ask on the side of the aisle? No? Okay. 
Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of our witnesses for their testimony today. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. <laughs> is Hollingsworth here? Oh, Mr. Hollingsworth is here, if it, that's all right. Uh, Madam Chair, in, uh, in the uh, momentarily, I, I'd like to also submit a uh, letter from the American Securities Association uh, into the record. With, without objection. Thank you. The gen gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, is recognized for five minutes. Well, I apologize for being a second late. I wanted to ask Dr. Lewis about a few things. Um, number one, what in the short run determines an employee's wage? Uh, what are the short run determinants of an employee's wage? Yeah. I assume employee's wages are based in a market for labor. Right, supply and demand, right? Demand. Yeah. As demand goes up, supply is relatively static, right? Wages go up, right? As demand falls, supply remains relatively static. Most of that gets translated into wages, right? And ultimately, that price clears the market, right? Correct. It's not a benefic offering by a corporation that determines an employee's wage. In the short run, it's the supply and demand. In the long run, Right? It's the marginal productivity of labor. As we increase the productivity of American workers, which we've done a fantastic job of over the last 40 years, right? that marginal productivity of labor continues to go up and we can compensate labor more enhanced ways right? through wages. And I think that's really important to remember. The second thing I want to talk about is, is there any impact, is there any material impact, I should say, on a company's profit and loss statement on their income sheet from these, co from these corporate buybacks? So there's been a lot of discussion about the ability of sort of uh, share buybacks to increase earnings per share. But and my that is an increase in earnings per share, but that's not an increase in the earnings of the firm. You're good in aggregate, the firm earns X, right? And then it uses a portion of that after X income slash after X cash flow to purchase its shares. It may increase the earnings per share, but it doesn't change the aggregate earnings of the firm, right? I was going to get to that. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Basically, <laughs> yeah. uh, the argument is that earnings per share are, are sort of artificially increased through a share repurchase program. The problem with that thinking is that's a completely mechanical adjustment. The yeah. firm is exactly the same firm before the buyback as it was after the buyback. You're just dividing it by Except fewer shares. You have a little bit less cash around, but the yeah. operations of the firm are still intact. You're still generating exactly the same cash flows from your business as you were before. That's exactly right. I think that's a really important concept to remember because it would not be in a firm's interest. It's not as if a firm says, gosh, you know what, we have generated a certain amount of aggregate income, right? And we're looking for ways to deploy that aggregate income or cash flow, right? We can pay it back in dividends. We can reinvest it in the business. Or alternatively, we can buy our own shares back, which reduces that denominator of the number of shares outstanding. But it's not as though they're going to say, well, you know what, we should go back and maybe add more costs to our income sheet, right? It's not a choice, that's a fake choice to say, oh gosh, this is a choice between wages, right, and whether we buy more shares back, right? That's a real fake choice because one is an income sheet driven thing, right? Supply and demand for labor, wages, employee costs, personnel costs, et cetera. The other is what are we doing with after tax cash flows in order to reinvest, enhance the returns to investors going forward, right? Which makes our shares more attractive over the long run and makes the business better over the long run if they plow that back into the business or they plow that back into driving up those earnings over time, right? That's right, if they plow it back into business in productive opportunities. That's exactly right. And so I think it's really important to remember both in the short run, wages are not affected by company benefic policies. Wages are affected by the supply and demand of labor in that particular area for that particular set of skills Right? In the long run, us increasing the skill set of individuals, making them more productive. Americans are the most productive workers around the world, but we can make them even more productive with tools and capabilities, better training, better education, et cetera. Right? That increases their wages over time. But it's not companies making a decision, gosh, you know, we've got some extra money laying around. Maybe we should just go pay people more. Right? Ultimately, that's going to be determined in whether that price, that wage, clears the market or not. And I think it's really important to remember that these things that affect the income statement are separate than decisions about what we do with excess capital after they flow through the income statement. We've already made the revenue. We've already paid all of the costs of goods sold, right? We've already paid all of our overhead, whatever that may be. We've generated X at the bottom line, right? And now we're going to decide how do we reinvest that, right? Whether we invest that in lowering the, share, the number of shares outstanding, whether we invest 
invest that in buying more equipment, whether we invest that in new opportunities, buying new businesses, for example, that's a separate decision than, oh gosh, maybe we should go back and use some of this bottom line to add more to our costs. They won't do that unless it's necessitated by the supply and demand in the market, right? I would agree with that. Great, thank you. With that, I'll yield back. Thank you, and, and, and I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for your testimony today. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask all witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are capable. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>